thank you for joining us tonight. For those of you who I have not met, I'm Hal Stern. I'm the dean of the Donald Bren School of Information and Computer Sciences. And it's my thrill to invite, to welcome you to Ingenuity 2016. Uh, <laughs> we have at least one enthusiastic uh, member, <laughs> member of the audience. Um, my partner in crime, uh, Dean Greg Washington from the Henry Samueli School of Engineering. Uh, we've been doing this, I think this is year four. Is that what we figured out? This is uh, year four. Um, and it's a really fun night for us. What we try to do is uh, three very different things um, all in one fun-filled uh, night, which is uh, we'll have a keynote speak, uh, speaker, and I'll do that introduction in a little while. We're going to recognize uh, some folks who've been very influential to a lot of lives in our, in our students, in our schools. Um, we we'll recognize them, and then we'll show off some of uh, what universities do best, which is produce the next generation of, of talent uh, for those of you who have companies, for, those, uh, for all of us, the things they can do in, uh, in the world at large. Um, so we have the best student projects uh, from ICS, my school, and engineering, uh, Greg's school. So we're really excited. We invite uh, the community, we invite the alumni, we invite everyone back. Um, we'll try to keep the program moving and so that there's time afterwards for folks to have an opportunity to visit with the student teams and learn about what they've been doing uh, while we enjoy some refreshments in the, in the courtyard. So uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, this is uh, really intended as a celebration of the activity and technology that happens at UCI. And as all of you know, um, UCI is a wonderful, wonderful place, uh, an institution that has achieved a ton in its first 50 years and is really set to, to do even more in the years to come. So without any further ado, let me start the evening off by introducing our keynote speaker. We're really excited and pleased to welcome Eben Upton. Uh, Eben is the founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation and a distinguished engineer with Broadcom, a Fortune 500 semiconductor company. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit, but the Raspberry Pi is truly revolutionary in terms of bringing computing uh, at low cost to lots and lots of people. So we're really, really excited. Uh, in an earlier life, he founded two successful mobile games and middleware companies, IdeaWorks 3D, now Marmalade, and PodFun, held the post of Director of Studies for Computer Science at St. John's College, Cambridge, and wrote the Oxford, Oxford Rhyming Dictionary with his father, Professor Clive Upton. He holds a BA, a PhD, and an MBA from the University of Cambridge, and we're really excited to welcome him here tonight. Evan. Thank you so much. Um, so, so yes, my name's, uh, my name's Evan Upton. I, I work for a little local semiconductor company that you may have heard of called Broadcom. Um, but I've spent, um, I've spent quite a lot of the last few years doing something rather different, which is uh, this, uh, this charity that we started in Cambridge called Raspberry Pi. Now, I thought I'd spend a bit of time um, uh, really just telling the story of Raspberry Pi because it's been kind of an unusual journey for me as an engineer. Um, and then later on, I might try and draw some, I might maybe try and draw one or two lessons. Uh, from the experience that we've had. So, let's see. When I was, when I was 10 years old, um, I, I went to a school that had this thing in the corner of every classroom called a BBC microcomputer. I don't know if there are any, any Brits in the room who come across something called a BBC. BBC Micro, little beige, there we are, little beige box called the BBC Micro. So the, the BBC Micro is a funny thing. It's a, um, a, a microcomputer. It was launched in 1981. It was sponsored by our national broadcaster in the UK. So we actually had a kind of a national computer in the UK. And these things, it was a beige box, a late bit microcomputer. Um, and it sat in the corner of classrooms. Um, and it was largely, it wasn't actually used to teach computing. It was largely used to do other things. It was largely used to run, you know, uh, French teaching software or English teaching software. Um, but like a lot of 8-bit micros, it had this wonderful property that you turn it on and it goes beep. It has this lovely two-turn beep that I still recognize when you turn it on. Um, and the very first thing it does is give you a programming prompt. It gives you a basic prompt. And kind of the, the interesting thing, this is really shared with all of those BBC micros and this, the machines in this country like the Apple II and the Trash 80, the Commodore 64. You turn them on, they give you a basic prompt. And if you want to do something other than program them, then you, the, the first thing you have to choose, you have to choose not to program them. 
Um, and what this means is it's that kind of idea of choice architecture that um, pretty much everybody my age in the UK who went to, went to school about the same time as me could at least write that two-line computer program. You know, 10 print I am the best, 20 go to 10. Or uh, 10 print something much filthier than that, 20 go to 10. And you know, we used to do this. We used to go to our local, you know, our local equivalent of Best Buy or CompUSA uh, and type this into all the machines. And then hit, because that, that program is the same in all dialects of basic. Uh, and we'd type this into all the machines and then we'd hit enter on all the machines and then run out and then stand there against the windows as the, all the clerks in the store would run up and down trying to turn the machines off. Um, and this was, this was cool, and this, this didn't lead to everybody my age in the UK or everybody my age in the US um, becoming a computer programmer, but it did mean that we all had a chance to discover whether computer programming was, was something that we were excited about. And quite a lot of us did discover it was something we were excited about. Now, 1996, I turned up at the University of Cambridge. Now, University of Cambridge is, um, is one of those schools that has the... There are probably about 10 schools in the world, in the US, mostly in the US and the UK, that have some kind of claim to have developed the first computer. Um, and then they have some really complicated, specious argument as to why theirs was the first and everybody else's wasn't the first. Now, Cambridge is, I'll, I'll bore you with Cambridge's explanation. Um, Cambridge was the first university to produce a computer which was used substantially by people who weren't the people who had developed the computer. So it was the. I did say, I said I was going to bore you. Uh, you were already bored. Um, so so um, I mean, in practice, what this meant, this was the late 1940s, in practice, what this meant was the Department of Chemistry um, in the University of Cambridge was busy cranking out Nobel Prizes in the late 40s and early 50s using X-ray crystallography, was able, to, was able to buy time on a computer. It was computing as a service in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, so Cambridge is one of the, you know, it's one of the best places in the world to study computing. Uh, and when I turned up there in 1996, you had to fight your way over an enormous pile of other people to get a place. So we admit about, we, we admitted then and we still admit now, about 80 people a year to read computer science at the university. Uh, and at the point I applied, we had about 600 applicants for those 80 places. And that's pretty typical for Cambridge. I'm sure it's pretty typical for a school like UCI as well. You know, intense competition to get into the best um, engineering schools. Um, and... That was great, and I had a wonderful time. Um, and about 10 years later, I'd done a doctorate, uh, and I got this job, as, um, as Dean Stern mentioned, I, I, I had a job uh, called Director of Studies, and the Director of Studies in a subject is responsible for going out and is responsible for organizing the undergraduate teaching in a subject, and is also responsible for going out and finding more undergraduates. So you're responsible for going out and talking to high schools and explaining to people why your subject is the best, um, and you're responsible for interviewing. And we have this interviewing procedure in December, which is incredibly brutal. We get these kids in, and we, we really brutalize them. And I was really looking forward to it, because uh, I'd been brutalized in 1996. I'm like, OK, the boot's on the other foot now. I can, uh, I can brutalize some 18-year-olds. And um, it was the first week of December in 2004. And it was, it was a profoundly depressing experience, because I'd expected to have a whole week of fun brutalizing 18-year-olds. And I, I had an afternoon. Uh, our numbers had collapsed. And what we'd seen between 1996 and 2004 was a decline from about 600 people wanting, to come, wanting our 80 places to under 250. We were down to a ratio of maybe two and a half, two and a half to one, five to two, um, which by Cambridge standards is catastrophic. Um, these were still bright people. Uh, we were still able to find enough people to fill our course. But it was starting to look a little bit dicey. You know, it was starting to look like if this trend carried on for more than a few more years, then we were going to have to consider shrinking the size of our intake in order to maintain our quality. Um, and a group of us at the university sat down and, and asked ourselves uh, uh, what might have caused this. And what we happened on was, well, we asked ourselves where our recruits had come from. And of course, all of our recruits in the 1990s had come through exactly the same route that I had come from. We don't really teach computing, or at least then, we didn't really teach computing in schools. What we relied on was a stream of um, people who had effectively taught themselves um, that computing was something they were interested in. This isn't a problem the physicists have. This isn't a problem the mathematicians have. Um, if you are at school and you're good at physics, it doesn't take an enormous leap of the imagination to think, I want to do some more of that. You know? Particularly um, here, where it costs money to go to, you know, to go to university. In the UK, I actually was paid by the government to go to the university. Back in the 1990s, they used to pay us. Now, it's much more like the United States. People have to pay to go to university. Um, but it doesn't take a giant leap of imagination to go do more of something that you're really enjoying. Um, to go and study computer science at university, 
or to go and study engineering for that matter. You know, we don't really in the UK teach anything. We don't even have in the UK anything similar to the idea of shop class that you have here that gives you some sort of exposure to engineering. Um, at school level. Um, engineering and computer science suffer from a lack of a pipeline, a lack of a natural academic pipeline to bring new students in. Um, and our hypothesis, and it remains a hypothesis, you know, we're nearly 10 years into doing Raspberry Pi now, and our hypothesis was and remains um, that we'd been benefiting from this kind of informal pipeline, that the availability of cheap, um, accessible computing in children's bedrooms, effectively, uh, in the corners of schoolrooms and in children's bedrooms, um, was, provo was, was um, providing us with a, an alternative route into engineering subjects. Um, and of course, what happened in the 1990s was those machines went away. You know, those 8-bit microcomputers were not succeeded by an equivalently programmable set of 16 and 32-bit microcomputers. They were largely succeeded for a lot of children by games consoles. We have these devices now which are massively powerful in all of our pockets. You know, compared to the machine that I had, my 2 megahertz BBC Micro that I had back in the 1980s, um, my phone is an enormously powerful computer, but it's also a completely closed platform. You know, you can, you can write programs for your phone, but you can't write programs on your phone. What that means is that people are no longer lured into the, the choice architecture has been inverted. We've gone from a world in which you had, your machine was by default programmable, and to do anything other than programming, you had to choose not to program, to an environment in which um, your device is by default not programmable, and you have to choose, if you're lucky, you have a machine like a PC, which is programmable. Um, but you have to, even on the PC, you now have to choose to go out and get those tools. You have to choose to become a programmer. So the hypothesis with Raspberry Pi was that we had, um, um, the increase in the usability of computers, which is, of course, a wonderful thing. You know, a vast number more people are able to benefit from, you know, having powerful computers in their lives than, than ever could before. Um, but that what we've lost is well, that was that unintended consequence of the unusability of 1980s computers, which is this stream of kind of free, self-trained young people who've discovered off of their own accord that they want to be engineers. Um, so what happened? Um, we tried to build something, and we had this idea that if only we could build a machine which was cheap, we wanted a thing which cost about the same as a school textbook, we know that schools can uh, ask their students to buy textbooks, so if we could make a machine which cost the same as a textbook, that felt like there wouldn't be barriers to access. We wanted a device which was robust, that could be put into a school bag and taken out. We believe very strongly that children should own their computers. Uh, we don't believe in class sets of Raspberry Pis. We believe in children owning them and putting them in their school bag at the end of the day. We wanted a device which was fun, because we had to remember that those machines that we bought in the 1980s, we didn't necessarily buy them for, uh, you know, um, because they were worthy machines. I, I bought my BBC, I did buy my BBC Migrator program on, but I was a big geek. Um, most people um, got their machines to play games on, or they were bought their machines by their parents to do schoolwork on. They were not bought them as programming tools. So we wanted something which was useful as something other than a programming tool. And of course, we wanted a machine which was programmable. We wanted a machine which we could bundle every programming tool you've ever heard of. Um, on. And um, we tried a lot of things. Um, my earliest prototype was in uh, built in 2006, actually, almost exactly a decade ago, just before I joined Broadcom. Um, and it was broadly as powerful as those machines in the 1980s. It met the price target and it met the programmability target. And it was fairly robust, um, but it wasn't any fun. And it wasn't any fun because it was about as powerful as the 1980s computer, and it's unrealistic to expect children to find these, uh, to find a machine which is only as powerful as an Apple II, exciting in this day and age. So um, we tried a lot of things. Uh, I joined Broadcom, um, and well, one thing I discovered when I joined Broadcom was that Broadcom had a bunch of chips that I could use to build exactly this sort of thing. Um, by 2008, we had something that we thought was plausible. Um, it was a little machine that uh, only ran Python. Um, we started a foundation. We wondered what to call the foundation. And we thought, well, um, fruit named computer companies are good. There's a lot of fruit named computer companies. <laughs> um, and uh, most of the fruits are taken. There are so many fruit named computer companies, aren't that many left. Um, so so we, picked, we picked one. And we picked, of course, Raspberry because I don't know if this is the case in the, the do you say blah, blah, Raspberry in the like. Pfft, that thing, right? You say that, right? Okay. So Raspberry is the rudest fruit, and that is literally why we're called Raspberry. Um, and we had a machine which just ran Python. It, all it did booted into Python the same way your Commodore 64 boots into Basic. And so we thought Pi, Pi, Raspberry Pi, that'd be kind of fun. So we we called it we we 
founded a charitable foundation called Raspberry Pi. Um, we then decided we didn't like the thing we'd made. We decided it wasn't general purpose enough. Um, in particular, it lacked a um, it lacked the ability to run Linux. Now, the ability to run Linux was kind of trans transformative for us because it allowed us to leverage that enormous amount of work that's gone into the Linux platform. Um, so we tried a bunch of other stuff. Very fortunately, a Broadcom chip came along that happened to have all the features that we wanted, plus an ARM, which allowed us to run Linux. And so really by 2011, we had something which you would recognize as a Raspberry Pi, but we were kind of dawdling along. You know, this is already, this was, you know, we had the realization in 2004, this was 2011. We'd been dawdling along for kind of seven years. Um, and because many of us are very attached to the whole BBC Micro idea, many of us who are involved in Raspberry Pi had BBC Micros. We really wanted to call it BBC Micro. And we kept going to see the BBC. Uh, and the BBC kept saying, no, 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 no we, can't, we can't, can't do this. Sorry, European Union competition law or some spurious explanation like that. And we went to see a guy called Rory Catherine Jones, who's a BBC a technology correspondent whose wife, I believe, was a trustee of the BBC. <clears throat> we thought he'd be perfect because he was a journalist and he had family connections to, to management. And he said no as well. And this is in May. This is, this is pretty much exactly five years ago in, in, in May 2011. But what he did say was, could I put it? Uh, it sounds like a great idea. Could I take a video of you and put it on my blog? Um, and he, um, uh, he did. Um, and we were idiots. We said yes, because we didn't know what this meant. Um, and he, we got 600,000 YouTube views in two days for this. People love this idea so much. 600,000 YouTube views in two days. And I didn't do a lot of work at Broadcom those two days. I just, uh, I just sat at YouTube pressing F5 and watching my how popular are you counter kind of winding up. Um, and and I, <laughs> my head was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and and I, went, I went home, had to go through the door sideways. Um, and uh, and my, um, I sat down, the second day, sat down uh, opposite my wife Liz for dinner. And we looked at each other across the table. And we realized that we'd promised to build 600,000 people a um, $25 computer. And we had not the faintest idea how to do that. <laughs> And this is the ultimate oh shit moment. Um, so, so I had a very bu busy 20, 2011. I um, uh, first trying to figure out, we had a back of an envelope calculation. It's one of these wonderful engineering back of an envelope calculations where you go, well, if I add up the cost of the Broadcom chip and the RAM, uh, that's a lot less than $25. So I'll be able to make it for $25. And what we forgot, of course, is that a device like Raspberry Pi, even the original Raspberry Pi, has about 180 components apart from the RAM and the Broadcom chip. Um, and most of those components cost a tenth of a cent. They're mostly you know, the dust, um, passives, resistors, and little tiny surface mount resistors and capacitors. But quite a lot of them, tens of them, are not those things. Tens of them are things, things like HDMI connectors. I had no idea how much an HDMI can. I now know more about how much HDMI connectors cost in various places in the world than I ever wanted to know. Um, but it turns out, actually, if you start adding up those components, you very, it's those things that kill you. It's those things that, so I had a very busy 2011 trying to figure out how to get cheap HDMI connectors. I, I mortgaged my house and used it to buy chips. Um, I found a Chinese contract manufacturer with some help from a, a Broadcom employee in Taipei. Um, I, I mortgaged my house. I, I bought, you can't send chips very easily to Shenzhen, which is where we were manufacturing them. What you do is you send them to Hong Kong and they move them across the border. Um, I mortgaged my house, spent all the money on chips, and then sent them to a transshipment point in Hong Kong. And the contract manufacturer was so small, the transshipment point was, a, um, was an apartment. And so, I, so half the money went on chips, and then the other half got wire transferred to this guy. Um, and then I had this horrible... Uh, this horrible waiting game. They said it'll be three. It'll be three weeks, and then it didn't turn up after three weeks. And then it was Chinese New Year, and then I said nothing happens. And then another three weeks, and then and then ten of these turn up in a box. One of them looks like it's been stamped on, um, and the other nine they start up, but the Ethernet doesn't work because they forgot to put any transformers in the Ethernet path. Um, so, but remarkably, we got there. Um, we launched on the 29th of February 2012. Um, Partway through this, we, we realized that there was no way you're mortgaging your house and using it to buy chips, selling product, getting your money back, buying more chips is not a scalable way to grow a business. Uh, so we, so we, took a leaf, we took a leaf out of uh, Arm's book. We have a company in Cambridge that's become quite successful called Arm. Uh, and they're, of course, they don't make things. They're an IP licensing company. They design things and then license the designs to other companies, including Broadcom, um, to, to, to use to build chips. And so what we decided we wanted to be, we wanted to be an IP licensing company. Um, and that's really been the, the you know, that of, of all things has been the, the, the big thing that's underpinned the success of Raspberry Pi is although we're a not-for-profit, we can't raise money, uh, we can't raise capital by selling shares. Um, by becoming an IP licensing company, it took us out of the working capital loop. So, so where are we? We're 
four years in, we've launched three generations of Raspberry Pi. Um, they all cost between $20 and $35. Um, last year, we launched a little thing called Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a $5 computer, which has been flying off the shelves and gone very well. I hope some of you have been able to get your hands on them. They're still in kind of short supply. Um, uh, we've been able to buy, we sold 9 million of the big Raspberry Pis. Right? We thought we were going to sell 1,000. We thought if we sold 1,000 to the right 1,000 kids, we could solve our recruitment problems. So we're, we're uh, five, four orders of magnitude north of where we expect it to be. Um, because we've done that, we're actually able, the Raspberry Pi was, making the Raspberry Pi hardware was supposed to be our contribution. Right? By selling so many Raspberry Pis, the Raspberry Pi Foundation now has a charitable endowment that it can use to do much more traditional charitable activities. You know, we pay for teacher training, we produce a vast number of, of, of online resources. And the number of applicants to computer science at Cambridge last year was 800. So we are a third, we're 30% above in our applicants, 30% above where we were at the height of the dot-com boom. And that's a really encouraging that's a really encouraging place to be. So it's been kind of a wild ride. It's been a wild ride for an engineer. Right, I'm an engineer. I want to sit in a dark room and write computer programs. Um, it's been a wild ride because I have to go and stand on stage and do things like this. Um, one of the problems, I'm just going to just, um, I've got a couple of minutes left maybe. Um, one of the problems with successful, with success, is that people who, how we, I think we've been successful. When people are successful, they try and draw lessons from their success. And I think that's always really dubious because a lot of what happened was luck. And I could just stand up here and say, my advice to you is to be lucky, uh, like Raspberry Pi was lucky. And it's not a bad piece of advice. Um, I did write down some things I was going to suggest you should do, but then I've crammed them in. Ah, here we are. Okay. Um, three things. Um, I hope some of you have a chance to do something that's as awesome as Raspberry Pi because it's been brilliant. Um, if you do, try and do audacious things, right? Um, you know, mortgage your house and buy chips and send them to China. You know, you might get away with it, particularly if you're lucky. Um, but you know, try and do audacious things. You know, it's it's you know we've we've uh, you know we've 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 done a lot of surprising stuff with Raspberry Pi. We've gone to a lot of surprising places uh, afterwards. I'll hang around afterwards, and I, I can I can tell you engineering war stories that turn your hair white. Um, but you know, we've had a great time doing it. So audacity is good. Um, but the next one, I, the next one, be conservative. Um, so one of the things, yeah. So, so <laughs> having told you about like mortgaging my house, um, now be be conservative. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about Raspberry Pi, I said we've done three generations of Raspberry Pi: Raspberry Pi one, Raspberry Pi two, Raspberry Pi three. One of the things that's really marked that out is the is the extent to which we've tried to change very small amounts of stuff between generations. We're all engineers here, you know. We like to do um, crazy stuff. I just told you to be audacious. We like to do crazy things. Engineers like new stuff. Engineers like magpies. They like shiny things, right? Um, the temptation with something like Raspberry Pi would be to make Raspberry Pi two wildly different and much better in every way. To start from scratch every time. Um, starting from scratch in engineering is almost always the wrong thing to do. If you have something that works, try to pick one thing that doesn't or that you're not quite happy with and change that. Uh, incrementalism and conservatism is the heart of good engineering. And finding that balance between audacity and conservatism is you know, how you do this stuff. Um, and the last one is be persistent. I mean, this has been a long journey, 2004 to 2016. Uh, the first two thirds of that time, we had no product. Right. Be persistent. There were days, you know, find people, again, be lucky. Have people in your life who will help you be persistent. I remember, particularly my family members, I have I've had a wonderful chance to work with my, with my wife uh, on this. Um, my parents, my wife, my friends, there were periods of time during the Raspberry Pi story where I did not believe in Raspberry Pi. Uh, but there was always at least one person who kept believing. Uh, and, you know, be lucky. If, you, if, if I encourage you to be lucky in one way, have people in your lives who will help you be persistent. Um, i just leave you with one thing. Um, the, one of my old tutors at Cambridge, um, one of my old tutors at Cambridge uh, told me there's, a, there's kind of a mistake people make about education. Um, they think that the point of education is to give young people the benefit of knowledge. Uh, and he said that's, that's completely wrong. The point of education is to give knowledge the benefit of young people. Um, you know, the, you know, we, we have, you're, you're, you are 
incredibly lucky, as you and the audience who are students, you're incredibly lucky to be at an institution like this and having the opportunity to study engineering here. Um, but engineering is incredibly lucky to have you. Right? Engineering is incredibly lucky that people like you have chosen to give up years of your lives to train to become engineers. We are confronted with enormous challenges in the UK as a country. You're confronted with enormous challenges here in the US. Uh, we're confronted with enormous challenges as a species. And it is engineers, it's people like you, who are the people who are going to solve those, those, those problems. So I just thought I'd conclude by thanking you for giving me the opportunity, thanking um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here with you. Really looking forward to seeing some of your stuff later on. And yeah, go do audacious stuff conservatively. Thank you. Please give another round of applause to Evan Upton. Look. The Raspberry Pi is a cool machine, and uh, we use them extensively on campus. Our students use them in undergraduate projects. Uh, you, you all are sitting in front of history now, because with a $5 computer, a $5 computer, everybody in the world will have access. And when everybody in the world has access, that's when audacious things happen, not just here, but everywhere in the world. And that is a cool thing. Please give another round of applause. <clears throat> and not only that, in his spare time, he doubles as the transporter. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the students know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so why are we here tonight? We are here to highlight uh, the Ingenuity Award winners. And what these, uh, 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 this program is all about is uh, it's a long process of students who work on their senior projects and they go through uh, developing and putting these projects together and then a group of us go through and choose the top ones in engineering and the top ones in information and computer sciences. And then those students are invited here to talk to you about their projects today. That's really uh, what this is all about. We also uh, recognize that this kind of thing doesn't happen. These uh, what we're able to do in our academic programs does not happen without the support of some really, really dedicated people. People who not only give of their material resources, but give of their time, give us advice, really help in the uh, formation and direction of our academic programs. You know, there's an old saying that says, look, if you see a frog at the top of a flagpole, you know he didn't get there by himself. And you look at our programs today and how well they're doing, they're doing because the community has embraced engineering and the community has embraced information and computer sciences and it's that embracing that's important. So we also take time today to thank those individuals who have been sowing into us, who have been sowing into these programs, who have been sowing into all of these students for long periods of time. One of those individuals, the first of those individuals today that we'd like to uh, recognize is Ms. Paula Golden. As president of the Broadcom Foundation, Paula manages all aspects of Broadcom Foundation to fulfill its mission of promoting equitable access to STEM education for the untapped talent in our society, including young women and minorities and <clears throat> in Orange County and, 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 and around the country. She directs 
funding and implementation of, broad, of, of the foundation's university research worldwide. In addition, she has initiated the foundation's signature programs, including the Broadcom Masters. If you haven't heard anything about the Broadcom Masters, it is a fabulous program. It's an international middle school science and engineering competition that inspires sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students to continue their studies of mathematics and science and, and promotes that uh, continuation all the way through high school. When you meet these kids, they're some of the brightest in the entire world. And oftentimes, well, a few times, we've got to engage them here. It's been fabulous. <clears throat> she also supports Broadcom Presents Design, Build, Design Code and Build, uh, which promotes learning and the STEM ecosystem that brings together both informal and, and formal STEM learning collaborations to ensure that all young people are STEM literate and have the essential skill, the essential skill sets to acquire 21st century uh, STEM careers. As a graduate of Wellesley College, Paula was the assistant dean and instructor of law at the New England School of Law where she obtained her Jewish doctor. She has served as the chief counsel and deputy of the Massachusetts DMV. I do not know why that's there. <laughs> She's a member of the Governor's High Technology Council, the executive director of the Engineering Center and Engineering Center Educational Trust, and director of neuroscience development at the University of California, Los Angeles. A finalist in the Los Angeles Area Emmy Awards, Paula was TEDx's presenter in 2013 and currently blogs for the Huntington Post. So our first Ingenuity Award winner tonight is Paula Golden. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, I just want to quickly say just a few things. Uh, following Eben is, is special to me because I lived those years with him in the early days of Raspberry Pi. And um, when people say, what is Broadcom? Um, my uh, CEO, CEO, CEO I was privileged to serve with, uh, Scott McGregor would say, you know, we're kind of a secret company. We don't talk much about what we do. And it's true. We always have kind of the secret sauce behind a lot of the technology that people use. Um, and one of the things about being the secret sauce uh, is you end up with a nightmare that I think is consistent with what Evan was pointing out. You end up with a society of consumers, not creators. And when Scott and Henry, Henry Samueli and others uh, on the Broadcom team decided to set up a foundation, I think behind their fundamental mission of supporting STEM education was to develop a generation of creators, not consumers. And I think we've done that in the signature programs that we have, and we have a lot to be proud of. So it's with great humility that I accept an award on behalf of the work of the foundation. In this room, I just want to comment a number of people who are here represent informal learning and formal learning. Uh, people that I've worked with from the Girl Scouts and the Discovery Cube, friends who've uh, elevated programs in the science fair competitions in Orange County and Irvine, which Broadcom is privileged to, um, to fund through the foundation. Um, you're my heroes. You're people who have seen the importance of what needs to be done in order to have young people aspire to become engineers. And we'll focus on that for the moment, but I think with the science fair, we also we, we aspire to have kids realize their dreams and passions of inquiry and uh, personal development that becomes ultimately social contribution. That, that whole process has really come about in the Broadcom Foundation. Um, the heroes are in this room, and I applaud you. One of them is my sister, who took time out of her life to come here, a great contributor to science and medicine. And my brother-in-law was also kind enough to come, who is in his field a, a great professional in finance and law. Um, without people who aspire, um, we will not have this great university. 
And in the end game for the foundation, it has always been UCI. As much as we love the 80 universities that my colleague Nick Alexopoulos uh, and I visit around the world, this is home for us. And what we aspire to is to have every kid we've touched in Orange County aspire to come to this great university and if they're very lucky get to spend time with our young people and with Greg Washington and our deans who make this place so very special and a real asset not only to Orange County but to the nation and the world. So on that note I want to again accept this award on behalf of the foundation and my colleagues everyone in the room who has made the foundation something very special going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, and congratulations, Paula and the Broadcom Foundation. Uh, for ICS, uh, I'm really pleased to be able to honor one of our own, uh, an ICS alum, uh, graduate in the class of 1986, uh, John Tycro. Uh, John is a senior vice president of research and development at Irvine-based Quality Systems Incorporated, where he leads the company's healthcare interoperability organization under the Mirth brand. Uh, John co-founded and was president of Mirth, uh, an open source healthcare software company, when QSI acquired the company in 2013. John has 30 years of software engineering and management experience, and prior to forming Mirth, he held various positions, including director of software engineering and VP of European operations for an artificial intelligence company. Uh, we are we have choosing to honor John for the way that he's given back to our university. One of the things I take great pride in as dean is our, we try to encourage all of our students, we make all of our students through the curriculum, get experience working in teams. So that as seniors, they do the senior projects uh, in teams, and you'll see some of the outcome of that in a, in a little while. But one of the things we do is we look to partner with companies to provide projects for these teams. And John has been giving back from pretty much the moment he left. Um, so over the 30 years or so, he has sponsored teams and mentored more than 100 ICS students. And he's done something really interesting and fascinating, which we still use to try and uh, connect with industry. He, mon he mentors a team of students, and then he'll hire some or all of those students as interns, and some or all of those interns as employees. And in the course of building up the company Mirth, uh, before QSI bought it, uh, more than half of his employees are ICS undergraduates hired through that sequence. So it's kind of the ultimate success for me of the university and the community and what we can do together um, in, in bringing young people to knowledge, uh, as, as Evan says. Um, so we're really uh, pleased to recognize John. Now, John, unfortunately, could not be here tonight. Um, I should have been suspicious. I knew he was very honored to get the award, but he gets very nervous in front of crowds. So he kept telling me that. So he managed to take a trip to India, so he couldn't be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but he took care of us uh, exceedingly, exceedingly well. Uh, John has arranged uh, for Shelley Raisin, who is the chairman of the board of QSI, uh, to be here to accept the award in his honor. So I'm really pleased to be able to give it to Shelley on for, for John. So thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, John has uh, been a very special person in my life as well as he has been uh, with the university here. Uh, I first uh, came to know John a few years ago uh, when he had this interesting company that some of our people in our company said, gee, we ought to buy this company. And I said, gee, I don't know anything about it. And uh, anyway, I got interested and determined that it was a great, great fit for our company. and. Uh, Along the way, things were going a little sideways. And so I met with John, and he told me about a bunch of things that were said to him, and I said things said to him, and I said, none of that's true, John. But we got to an affinity for each other. And from that day on, I said, look, I'm going to meet with you every day or call you on the phone every day till we finish this, uh, uh, this acquisition with you. So 
we were lucky enough to get him. Uh, I've got, uh, uh, first of all, to know uh, John and as a tremendous innovator and a, a tremendous entrepreneur. Uh, he asked me a couple of things. He, first of all, he, he wanted to apologize for being as far away as India. Uh, as when, I, when, I, when I told the dean that that's where he was, he says, well, that's pretty far. So, uh, so he did have a, a reasonable reason. Uh, the second thing uh, John asked me to do was uh, to uh, uh, give exceedingly uh, thanks to the, both the faculty and the students, uh, uh, both present and past, that he's come in contact with, and to convey how much it's been to him and how much benefit that he received uh, from having the collaboration and to having the things that he's done with UC Irvine. So he wanted to thank both the faculty and the students asked me to do that. And then he said in closing, he says, Shelley, you're an entrepreneur. You'll have a few entrepreneurs in the audience. Uh, say a, a word or two about what you learned on the area of entrepreneurship. And so I said, well, okay, I'll do that too. So I'll just take a minute there. Uh, first of all, I, I noticed the sign up here says ingenuity. And if you take a look at all the people that have created companies, they're all uh, innovative and they all have tremendous ingenuity. So that's a common characteristic of if you're looking to proceed as an entrepreneur. The second thing I learned, uh, which was kind of in my old age, was uh, that all of business really was three things. So if you want to be successful in business, there's three metrics that you want to look at. And uh, it, it, it was amazing that after all the complicated things that boiled down to three things, and these are the three things. One is that whatever the good of service that you're selling a product, it has to be a good deal for your customer. What that means is that that customer is better off buying that product or service from you than buying it from anybody else. And he's also better off buying it from you than not doing anything. So again, when you're looking and testing your ideas, remember that, that criteria. Uh, the second thing is, uh, and you've seen some of that here tonight, it has to be a good deal for the employees. Uh, the employees are better off working for you than working for anybody else. And lastly, it has to be good for the shareholders, it means it has to make money. So I'll leave you with those three thoughts. And with that, I want to again thank uh, the school and the faculty for this great award for John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley, for accepting that on John's behalf. Uh, so we mentioned at the start three, three uh, parts to the program. Um, the last part is, in many ways, uh, the most fun, which is to get to see the, the young people and their work. And I'm going to introduce uh, Hadar Ziv, who's a teaching faculty member in the School of Information and Computer Sciences, who helps run uh, one of the project courses that I described and plays a very significant role in putting together uh, the teams and, and preparing them for, for their contributions tonight. So he'll walk us through what's going to happen next. Thanks, Adar. Thank you, Dean Stern. Uh, I believe everyone deserves their 15 minutes of fame, but due to time constraints, I get three. <laughs> and in about two minutes, you'll know why. But one of the reasons is the students also get three minutes. Uh, each team, we have 11 teams presenting, so we're going to try to keep it uh, moving swiftly. As Dean Stern mentioned, some of the students are students of mine in my project courses, but I really get to handle only a, a small slice, my little micro universe of a couple of project courses in the School of ICS, Informatics and Software Engineering. I also get to see the game design project courses occasionally, and we have run, one representation here from the game program. So the 11 teams really represent a, a wide range of engineering projects, ICS projects, one game project, projects that participated in other competitions, uh, including the Beale and Butterworth competitions, and even competitions organized by industry partners, as they will describe to you. So let's acknowledge uh, 
first, all the students that are participating here tonight. Uh, earlier today, we had uh, a special reception for Dean Stern, so I wanted to once again acknowledge also the two deans and the wonderful work that they do for the two schools. Thank you, deans. Uh, just today, I had the last uh, class uh, meeting of uh, two project courses, one with 14 teams, one with 11 teams, so 25 teams altogether, just in two project courses that are finishing today. This goes along with the increase in numbers and attendance, and some of those numbers are better known to the deans and to my chair, Andre, and you can talk to them later. But we are experiencing the growth and the increase in, uh, in human intellect and human power that was covered in the earlier presentations. So it's time to acknowledge the benefits of young people and our students, starting with the first team. Everybody hear me? Okay, cool. All right, so. Hello everybody, my name is Juliana Andrews and today I'm gonna to be talking about the Hyperloop project here on campus. All right, so many of you may have heard of the Hyperloop in the news recently, but for those of you that haven't, back in 2013, Elon Musk released a paper that's sort of featuring this new form of high-speed transportation. And his plan is to construct a Hyperloop along the median of the five to make the commute time between LA and San Francisco 35 minutes. Wow. Now, since, uh, since 2013, there hasn't really been much development in this sort of new technology. So SpaceX has created this competition in which university teams are challenged to design and build a half-scale Hyperloop pod to be tested on a one-mile track. Now, this competition began back in September, and since then, we've had to go through various milestones, sort of like elimination rounds, which began with our preliminary designs. So 320 teams turned in their preliminary designs, and from that, SpaceX selected 120 to move on to submit their final designs and attend Design Weekend. Now at Design Weekend, we presented our ideas to SpaceX, and out of 120 teams from 23 different countries, we finished fifth place overall, and of the top five teams, we're the first team using air-based levitation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Also, another thing is that uh, our team, at the time of Design Weekend, there was only about 20 members, but since then, we've grown to about 50. So, big team. <laughs> All right, so now, real quickly, I'm gonna walk you through the pod. Now, this is what we're gonna be constructing for the competition. So, beginning with our fuselage. Here you can see our fuselage shape, and it's gonna be made entirely out of carbon fiber. Like our fuselage, our structure is made out of carbon fiber sandwich panels, as well as aluminum 6061 plates to help stiffen the structure. Now located on the four corners of the pod, we have our suspension system, and just beneath each suspension sy system, we have our levitation system. Oh, too many. Next, we have our stabilizers, which are located in the center of the pod, because for the, um, the competition, SpaceX is gonna be providing a rail, and so we'll use that kind of as a guide as we progress through the one mile. Also located in the center of the pod, we have our mechanical braking system, which is four race quality calipers, which will clamp onto the rail and utilize friction to bring us to a stop. Just outside of that, we have our magnetic braking system, which will induce eddy currents along that center eye I mentioned before, and that will help decrease our speed before initiating our mechanical brakes. Lastly, we have our air cylinders, our control system, and our piping, which is all encased in the fuselage. All right, well, that's all the time I have, so thank you so much for your time. And at our booth, we have a prototype for our suspension system, as well as a scaled model for the, the mold that we're gonna use to make the fuselage as well as various test rigs and machined parts for both our mechanical and magnetic braking system. So I really encourage you to come check it out and experience these firsthand. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, hello, my name is Eric and we are Sonder VR and these are some of the people that we have to thank uh, for being here today. But I don't have much time so let's just get right into it. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, well, we make virtual reality therapy experiences for people with autism so that they can learn and practice their social skills. Now, why is this important? Well, one in 68 children are diagnosed with autism, and as part of that, they go through an early intervention program that people recommend 25 to 40 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one counseling. 
Uh, that's very expensive and time consuming, so we thought we could use VR to help cut down on cost and time. Uh, why we chose to use VR is, one, uh, VR is a very immersive platform. Uh, number two, uh, the headsets are getting better and cheaper. And number three, you can do it at home by yourself. So what we did was we started with our mentor's book, The Social Compass Curriculum. Uh, it's a lesson plan to teach social skills. We took some of those modules, translated them into VR, then gave them to our users. And something we didn't get to in the project but we would like to do is run data analytics and give reports to therapists and parents so they can see how their child is progressing. Uh, probably the highlight of the project is we, we were invited to a private school for kids on the spectrum. Uh, I still remember one of the first questions they asked me, does it, does it play Minecraft? <laughs> He's like, yes, yes it does. And, and then he was like, cool. <laughs> um, but the response was very, very positive. Um, and so we have a couple VR modules for you to test out. We do have one problem in that we have one Oculus for like 200 people. Um, so we did, if you don't want to wait, uh, we exported the VR comic into, onto the web and also made a very, very small Google Cardboard experience, so you can try that out as well. So come check us out, and thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everyone. We are Center Health Tech. My name is Ahmed Zobi, and today I'm going to be talking to you about diabetic foot ulcers. So over 30 million people in the U.S. today are diagnosed with diabetes, and 7.5 million of those diagnosed have a high risk of developing a diabetic foot ulcer. 30% of those with diabetic foot ulcers, if left untreated, have to get a lower limb amputation. And once they do get that amputation, almost 50% of them die within the first five years. So what's currently being done? Well, current treatments for diabetic foot ulcers include skin grafts, but they're costly, ineffective, and have a tendency to be rejected by the immune system. Our solution incorporates centrifugal microfluidics to process fat taken from the patient. This fat has some stem cells in it that are activated once it goes through our device. And this allows for, and then once that is processed, we are, we are able to re-inject it back into the patient to promote healing. Our solution is creating a new market of prevention. It's cost effective, it's safe to use, and it's efficient. This is our device right here. It is using a microfluidic lab on chip system on a CD microfluidic platform. And once we uh, insert the fat and process it, as you can see here, this is the data for unprocessed fat, about 4% activation of the stem cells, and it increased up to 14% activation of the stem cells. So we hope that with more future optimization of our device, we're able to achieve a higher activation of these stem cells. So I would like to thank you for your time, and if you want to come on, we have our demo outside, so you can come and see our device. Thank you. All right, so we've all been there at one time in our lives. We're standing there, we're staring at our cell phones, waiting for something to download, whether it's a new app, whether it's a web page to load, whether it's cat pictures on Facebook. You know, there's always a point where you're in a dead zone and there's something really important that's come up and you need to get it faster. So you could be, you know, a businessman who travels from hotel to hotel. You could be like me where I'm at the grocery store trying to download recipes to figure out what to buy. But you have a poor signal strength, can't download it. Enter the M2 signal strength heat map app. Basically what you can do is you can download this app and once you've downloaded it in the background, it will actually start recording your signal strengths and location so that you can create a comprehensive signal history and be able to view exactly where you've been and what your signal strengths were like in those locations. We also have speed test verification so that once you do locate an area that is supposed to be, have a good signal strength, you can then go to that area, run a quick speed test, and the speed test will tell you whether or not that high signal strength actually equates to a faster download speed or not. Uh, the nice thing about our speed test verification as well is a lot of the speed tests out there right now are bandwidth speed tests, which will tell you what the maximum bandwidth is for your uh, connection, you know, Cox connection or whatever. It'll tell you what your maximum bandwidth is. We decided to go a different route, and with our algorithm, we actually just care about your single file download speed, which with a cell phone is probably going to be more important to you. You're not going to be torrenting a bunch of files. You're going to be wanting to download, you know, an email or you know, that, that cat picture from earlier. So basically our speed test will allow you to tell for that area exactly what your speed is. So what you'll be able to do is on the uh, left, you can see our, our heat signal uh, heat map. Basically what it'll do is it'll overlay a heat map of your signal strengths 
over the normal map and if you're that businessman and you've been to say you're going to Las Vegas you could just type in Luxor in the uh, address search and as long as you've been in that area before you'll be able to see what the signal strengths were you'll be able to see what hotels have better signal strengths than others you'll also be able to see um, you know what hotel rooms for example maybe you got a room that had a bad a dead spot so with this you can actually zoom all the way in and see relatively closely um, your signal strengths and then you can also see our speed test on the left. So now if you're that businessman or you're me, you can find out exactly what corner of the grocery store you need to go stand into to download your recipes in order to uh, purchase your goods. Um, so we do have a demo and we can also hand out APKs if you want to download our latest working thing. So you can try it out as long as you've got an Android phone. Um, we can supply you with that as well. So come check out our demo. At after all this is over. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Terry Jing Lang Liao, which is uh, so today I'm glad to introduce our senior project, Rename I Lost, which is an uh, indoor navigation system. <laughs> <laughs> so, why we need an indoor navigation system? Because we can imagine a scenario about if you're working in a uh, large shopping center, for example, the South Coast Plaza, and uh, you may get lost in the back building. And if you're looking for some stores and maybe you could not find it uh, because you have to go a long way to find that map. Then the, and some other things, when I f came to the first class about the, uh, the semester starts, I may could not find the, could not find my classroom. And then you can use the iLoss to you find your classroom, you not be late. Yeah, so our goal is to develop a, like a GPS system just compatible for indoor environments. So this uh, schematic shows how it works for our system. However, we use the wireless transmission technology called iBeacon, which is using the Bluetooth low energy. You, uh, you guys may heard about it. And just using the beacons placed down in the building, and we use our smartphone to detect the signal strength to determine where it is. So in our system, we features like a high accuracy. Uh, we tested about the, uh, the error rate about two meters, and it's low power consumption. Because each beacon use the button battery, they can uh, last up to two years uh, under their operations constantly. And it's uh, and interface friendly because we design our apps just like for this example. We're using it's just generally it look like you're using the Google Map or uh, other applications. It's very similar, and it's moderately low cost. Uh, each beacon costs about ten to twenty bucks, and ten beacons may cover like four thousand square feet something. And it uh, have a very big commercial potentials. Let's see what we can do under this system. Yeah. So maybe we can apply on the school, and you can sync with the schedule, and the students can use the app that can be finding their classroom at the right time. And also, they're in the museum, uh, when the, guests, the visitors come over the exhibitions, and uh, the apps can show the details and specifications. Uh, and also, similarly, in the shopping mall, and the store can push up some promotions and discount information, which enhance their shopping experience. And in the supermarkets, uh, the people can just look up their items, what we want, uh, what they want, and it will guide them to the right slots. Yeah, and we decide to further developing our apps and to have those functions. And now we have a prototype. Oh, sorry. So now we have a prototype. Just uh, come to the booth to see our demos. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Cecilia Vishton and my team created Cavern Tavern. So Cavern Tavern is a game that was created as a part of the two quarter capstone course with the computer game science program here at UCI. Um, we were advised by Dan Frost and Richard Wing and we also had the incredible opportunity to be mentored by employees from Blizzard. Um, they would come every other week and advise us on everything from game design and programming to art and sound design and um, it was just incredibly useful. And, um, we recently competed in the IEEE Games Day competition, and we tied for first place, as well as winning Intel's Best Game Made by a Woman-Led Team Award. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
So um, over the two quarters, we were able to complete the main gameplay, but we're still working on it, and we have a lot of features that we'd like to add in the future. So um, about the game, it's, a, it's built in Unity, and it's designed for Android and iOS. It's a time management game about two girls who are running a medieval tavern together with levels based on days the tavern has been open for business. So the main gameplay is all about getting your orders out to customers on time within the time limit of the level. And in order to beat a level and unlock the next one, you have to meet a certain profit margin for that day. Um, we wanted to add a twist to the time management genre. So what we did is have the player control two characters at once. The waitress controls the right half of the screen and the chef controls the left half of the screen. They have different capabilities, but they have to work together if they want to beat the game. So um, Cavern Tavern is all about upgrades. As you um, beat the levels and you're earning money from the profits, you can use the, that money to upgrade your tavern, such as like um, upgrading your ingredients so you can charge more, how your tavern looks so your customers are happier, and your cooking tools so that they work better. Um, as your tavern gets better, then um, more different types of customers will come inside. You start out serving peasants, but eventually artisans, middle class, nobility, and even royalty will be a part of your crowd. <laughs> Um, higher ranked customers are more impatient and they demand more food, but you get more payments in return. So um, we, we hope you'll stop by our booth and give the game a try. Thanks for your time. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Crowley, and I have the honor of representing the Fuel Cell Data Center team. Tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our project, some of the tests that we've conducted on key system elements, as well as predictions from our mathematical model. But first, a little bit of background. So as we progress into our technological era, we store a wealth of information in data centers, which require tremendous amounts of energy. Now, currently, our world energy demands are being mainly met through oil and coal, the burning of which produces, fossil, uh, produces greenhouse gases, leading to the degradation of our environment. We have created a system capable of providing continuous power to a data center by means of completely renewable energy. So seen here on the left is a cartoon of our system. Energy enters our system through solar panels at the top. Some of this energy is sent directly to the data center or server rack here. However, the remaining energy is sent through an electrolyzer in order to be turned into hydrogen for later use. This hydrogen is then run through a fuel cell to run the, the data center during non-peak solar hours. Seen on the, on the right-hand side here, is a power profile of several key system elements. The data center modeled in yellow is a constant load, so it has a straight line. Our irregular solar energy is seen by this uh, jagged blue line here. Well, the gray area between these two curves represents the energy that we send to our electrolyzer. So speaking of our electrolyzer, we ran dynamic, uh, dynamic cycling tests on our electrolyzer early in our course. So our electrolyzer was hooked up to a solar array, and the irregular solar energy produces an irregular volume flow rate of hydrogen out of the electrolyzer, seen here in this blue line. So the irregular hydrogen flow rate actually, uh, actually gives us a rather linear increase in pressure seen here in orange. This is desirable as it simplifies some of the controls in our model of our overall system. Moving on to our mathematical model, this graph here represents the alleviated cost, or alleviated social cost with the implementation of our system. Previous data indicates that with a solar array size of 400 square meters and a hydrogen tank size of 6.3 kilograms, we can achieve 100% renewability. This also means that we have a, a $500 uh, alleviated social cost. And this doesn't seem like much, but all, of these, all this data comes from a six kilowatt server rack. Now just imagine your typical 100 megawatt data center. So our team has a lot that we'd like to talk with you about. So please come check us out at our booth later on. Thank you all so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Glenn Pittman, and I'm a member of Team Astro. And our project is a dashboard that we developed for our client Astronix test systems based here in Irvine. Astronix builds systems for testing electronics equipment, uh, anything from aircraft avionics to healthcare equipment to uh, microchips. They're typically large scale systems that are not portable, often housed in facilities not unlike what you see here. 
uh, Astronix identified a use case in which a user may want to monitor the readings from their test systems remotely. Uh, currently, with Astronix current software, Activate, which you see here, this is capable, this is not possible. Um, so our task was to make uh, a system that's complementary to Activate, that's user-friendly, customizable, and accessible from anywhere. So our solution is a, a web-based dashboard that offers a, a modern, uh, clean, customizable UI um, that's accessible in any um, modern web browser. The user simply types in the URL for the Activate system that they would like to connect to. At that point, on the left-hand column, uh, it'll list the measurement devices that are available for that particular system. Under each device are the parameters that are available for monitoring. The user simply selects the parameter they would like, which those then show up in the small boxes in the middle. They're grouped together by device. Here we see a digital multimeter and an oscilloscope. This is all updated in real time. From the beginning, the design was, was meant to be mobile friendly, so the user can uh, monitor their test devices on the go via a smartphone or a tablet. Please stop by our table for a demo uh, or to talk more about the tech that's behind everything. We can tell you everything you'd like to know or just to chat. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. For over 50 years, the gold standard in bone fixation hardware and small bone fragments has been titanium. However, having metal implanted in your body over time can lead to certain complications, such as stress riser fractures and stress shielding. My name is Frank Adams, and at Osteoforge Medical, we're choosing to rebuild bone with bone. Our composite bone fixation hardware and small bone fragments are made up of a polymer ceramic composite similar to bone. There are several key features that make this product interesting. First of all, it's fully customizable using our additive manufacturing process. This is a modified MakerBot dual 3D printer. The properties of the material are analogous to bone itself. It's completely non-toxic, it is fracture resistant, and ultimately it's bioresorptive. So this right here is our MakerBot dual 3D printer where we can fashion complex geometries such as this bone screw and this skull plate. So some of the material properties we were trying to mimic of bone were the porosity, the density, the flexural strength, and flexural modulus, all things that are very important in an implant. So as you can see, we were able to hit our porosity range. We were slightly low in our density, but our flexural strength and our flexural modulus were right on. Our density, what we learned was that if we infuse for a longer period of time, can actually increase that density. This is our, our cytotoxicity testing. So our product is non-toxic. These are human epithelial cells placed upon our sample. Not only did they survive, but they proliferated across the sample surface. Our material is also fracture resistant. This is a modulus of rupture test. Oops. This is a modulus of rupture test, and this is a SEM image of the fracture surface. So now as you can see, the infused polymer webbing in the fracture surface right here. So the infused polymer not only slows the propagation of fracture through the material, but in, a, in, in case of a traumatic failure inside the body, will keep the integrity of the part. And finally, our components are all completely bioresorptive. There's only two ingredients, our hydroxyapatite and our proprietary polymer, which due to IP considerations is a secret. Uh, <laughs> but because both of those have a bioresorption pedigree, our implants are known to be completely safe. So I want to thank before it, I want to thank our industry mentor Anthony Ruggiero, CEO of Spineworks, for showing up today, and my amazing team. Thank you guys very much. Hello, um, our client was Apples and Orange Studios, and we're Team OIG, Orange you Glad. I'm Lauren Dima Illig, and this is Zach Anderson. We're going to talk to you about a dashboard in Paris. So the producers at Apples and Orange Studios want to go beyond the traditional means of advertising, such as billboards and print ads. Um, for their on, currently on Broadway Tony Award winning show in American in Paris. One such, way is Facebook ad, one such way is Facebook ads, but they're not entirely sure if this is going to be effective. Luckily, the producers have a uh, dashboard in Paris, which is a dashboard web application which aggregates data from several sources such as ticket sales, advertisement spending, and social media. And this tracks the engagement of all users and exactly how many um, how many conversions, clicks, and impressions an ad will yield. And as a result, they'll be able to track the effectiveness of all marketing campaigns. And in turn, they'll be able to make smart, evidence-based decisions. So now I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about some of the accomplishments, the things that we were really proud of with this project. 
We gained real world experience in a very safe space. We were super lucky to be in this class because we got to work with a real client right there, Tim Kashani. He's a wonderful man. We got to work with producers of the Tony Award winning musical An American in Paris, and we got to see how crazy Broadway life was. It's very different than UCI life, <laughs> surprisingly. But not so surprisingly, Tim Kashani actually did graduate from ICS just like us. So he knew the labs that we worked in, and he knew exactly what it was like. So it was very fun working with him. And then also, we simultaneously developed a front end and a back end. We worked with people who have never actually built a back end, so we were very proud of ourselves for managing to get something out. Um, we deployed a real product, which was something really exciting for us because we had never done that before. And producers are actually using our application right now. We have gotten feedback, and our application has actually made it easier for them to see these trends that they couldn't see before. We gave them new ways to look at this data, and we're really, really proud of that. So we just want to say thank you to Ziv and the ICS department for giving us this opportunity to be a part of the senior design project. And there were lots of laughs and lots of tears, but ultimately at the end of the day, we were able to develop a product that we were really proud about. And if you'd like to see more, come visit us at our booth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm from the tag team. Um, uh, I have my teammates here. Um, we kind of had a disagreement on who, which of us should present, so instead we created a video for uh, all of you, and we'll, we'll show the video right now. This is Ben, a college student with a part-time job who was always attending meetings on the go. With so many things on his mind, he sometimes forgets his belongings, like leaving his keys in his office or his phone at home while leaving for work. When bad luck strikes, Ben loses important things like his wallet. Disappointed by this problem, he asks around for an inexpensive solution and then he comes to know about TAG. TAG is a small device that can be attached to anything. Once an item is tagged, Ben can simply track it using his smartphone. The TAG app allows Ben to ring items he can't find, making it easier to find the keys he accidentally dropped in the laundry basket. Ben can also see how far the items he tagged are through his smartphone. He can now easily find his car in that busy parking lot. Tag separation alert feature reminds Ben that he is forgetting his wallet at home while leaving. This small and accessible device can be used to trigger a pre-configured action on a phone, like sending a message to a contact, or sharing a real-time location with friends, or even something as simple as sounding an alarm on the phone. A double press on the tag is all that is required to trigger this action. The TAG app gives Ben access to the TAG's crowd network, which he can leverage to report an item missing. For instance, if Ben reports his keys missing and any other TAG users are within a few feet of Ben's keys, the user's phone securely communicates Ben's keys location back to his phone. And this will happen worldwide. Having adopted TAG, Ben can go about his day without worrying to keep track of his things. Buy a TAG today to lose your worries, not your belongings. Just like Ben did. We should thank Ben as well. Um, also, we have the we have the prototype of uh, the device, uh, and we have our uh, demo. Uh, if you'd like to see and uh, come and see, uh, we'd we'd, be, we'd love to show you a demo. Thank you. All right, what do you think? So, so so we we we're in the political season, and you hear lots of talk about the demise of this country and how things are not going well, the future's in really good hands. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> we have one more thing before we let you all go. Uh, this is the last program, uh, last initiative that Dean Stern and I will actually get to do together because as you all know, he is, um, uh, this is his last year as the Dean of the uh, Information and Computer Sciences School. And so we have a token of our appreciation for how, can you come up please? Uh, 
Uh, thank you. That's a real treat. Um, I said earlier for those uh, apologies for repeating for some who were here earlier this afternoon, but uh, working with Greg has been a real treat and uh, the School of Information Computer Sciences, the School of Engineering, uh, have a great deal in common and especially when it comes to interacting with the community and so we've really partnered and I think to great effect and, and really uh, I hope that's one of the positive legacies that I leave behind. Um, I'll still be at UCI, I'm not going far away. Um, but in particular it is gr a great moment and a great evening as I said at the beginning it's great to see the work of the students and uh, we created Ingenuity as a partnership of the schools uh, four years ago and I'm really excited about the event and look forward to its continuing for, for years to come. Uh, so I hope that you will join us outside where you can see and talk to our students and their projects. Uh, there'll be refreshments as well um, and we'll get a chance to talk to you as well. So thank you for joining us this evening and please meet us outside. Thank you. Thank you.